Hey guys, my latest video was deleted by YouTube for my Christian views on homosexuality and marriage. I was given a strike and can't upload or post on my main channel for 7 days. If you haven't already, please follow me on BitChute and Rumble as conservative channels are being censored. Links are in the description box and in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is $Watchman1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In a conversation on religious questions, Frederick II, King of Prussia, asked Joachim von Zieten, General of the Hussars, whom he esteemed highly as a Christian, for his plain and uncompromised views, give me proof for the truth of the Bible in two words, to which Zieten replied, Your Majesty, the Jews. The general statement reflected his understanding of not only the miraculous preservation of the Jewish people, but his belief that their preservation was for the purpose of bringing God's unfulfilled promises to pass. To Zetan, the present existence of the Jewish people was proof that God's word was true, because scripture had promised that they would remain until all that had been prophesied concerning them was fulfilled. Remarkably, this expression of faith was made in a day when the land of Israel was desolate of a Jewish population, and the majority of Jews were scattered among the nations. We need no further proof than the Jewish nation of Israel to show that we are indeed in the last days prior to Jesus' return. It's called BDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement. BDS are in fact all about creating political pressure on the state of Israel to allow economic, academic and cultural boycott or pressure on the state of Israel to allow millions of Palestinians to return to the state of Israel. Author Anat Wilf says BDS uses what she calls the placard strategy. Placard strategy is the equations that everyone who goes to an anti-Israel demonstration sees on their placards. Zionism equals, or Israel equals, or Star of David equals. It never says Zionism equals the political movement for self-determination of the Jewish people in their homeland, which is the accurate definition. And Wilf says it's been very effective, even though the equations are lies. There are words like colonialism, racism, apartheid, sometimes even Nazism, and genocide. These words are all chosen because in our collective consciousness, they connote evil. Basically, people are exposed to an ongoing refrain that says, Zionism, Israel, Star of David equals evil. It's not only about slogans on placards at demonstrations. It's in the United Nations, it's on television. Give an anti-Israel speaker 30 seconds on television, they'll manage to say Israel, Zionism, colonialism, apartheid, genocide in the same sentence, regardless of what is the question. BDS often claims to be a grassroots movement, but Sachi Gavrielli says there's nothing grassroots about it. One could be operating in New York, one could be in Italy. It's a network operated and being headquartered from Ramallah by an element or organization called the BNC, the BDS National Committee. Wilf says there's nothing new about the movement. The Palestinians are still committed to their old goal of no sovereign state for the Jewish people in any borders anywhere. The BDS movement continues the same old idea that the Jewish people are uniquely evil, that the world will be a better place if there was no Jewish state in it, which again is a very ancient anti-Semitic theme. Both Wilf and Gavrielli said it's important to keep fighting. Continue very vigorously and with Chazak Ve'ematz, as the Lord said, be very strong to tell the truth about Israel. First thing is really to expose BDS for what it is. That it might be non-violent in its means, but it is very violent in its ends. About the fact that it's not about peace. And ultimately they should be confronted on campuses, in the media, 
everywhere which they operate to expose them for their sinister purposes. The International Criminal Court has opened up the possibility of a war crimes probe into Israeli military actions in Palestinian territories. On Friday, the court ruled that its jurisdiction does extend to grounds occupied by Israel in the 1967 Middle East War. In a tweet, the Palestinian Authority welcomed the decision, but Israel's Prime Minister accused the court of legal persecution. When the ICC investigates Israel for fake war crimes, this is pure anti-Semitism. The court established to prevent atrocities like the Nazi Holocaust against the Jewish people is now targeting the one state of the Jewish people. When the ICC investigates Israel for fake war crimes, this is pure anti-Semitism. Was hatred of the Jews foretold in scripture? Hatred of the Jews is so common that a word has been coined to describe it. It is called anti-Semitism, a term recognized worldwide. But was hatred of the Jews actually foretold in the Bible? Yes. According to the prophet Jeremiah, God said, And I will pursue them with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence. And I will deliver them to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, an astonishment, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Deuteronomy 28.37 And you shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all the nations where the Lord will drive you. Astonishment is the Hebrew word Shema, which means ruin, by implication, consternation. Consternation means amazement or dismay that hinders or throws into confusion. Why did the Jewish people become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all the nations? Jeremiah 29:19. Because they have not heeded my words, says the Lord, which I sent to them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, Neither would you heed, says the Lord. Because the Jews' ancestors disregarded God and refused to obey Him, they faced a great tribulation of hostility and persecution lasting many centuries. Is there a lesson in this for the rest of us? Yes. The Apostle Paul wrote concerning the severity of God in punishing His chosen people. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in His goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Romans 11.22 the Christian church is doing the same thing that God warned the Jews about in Jeremiah 29, 19. Because they have not heeded my words, says the Lord, which I sent to them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, neither would you heed, says the Lord. Did Christians replace Jews as God's chosen people? No. I've heard many teachers say that nowhere in the New Testament does God reaffirm his covenant with the Jewish people regarding the land of Israel. If God promises something over and over again to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to their children, then he confirms it to Moses and Joshua, and reaffirms it through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the other prophets, does the absence of it in the new covenant make it null and void? Can God, who cannot lie, break his promise? I would think not. If so, our faith is on shaky ground. But still it's puzzling that the New Covenant doesn't affirm God's promises to Israel. Or maybe it does. Let's take another look. In Romans chapter 3, just after Paul makes the case that there is no need for non-Jews to be circumcised, that circumcision of the heart is far more important, he clarifies his point to make sure that his Roman hearers don't misunderstand him. He doesn't want them to assume that there is no covenantal value in being Jewish. So he says in chapter 3 verse 1, what advantage then is there in being a Jew or what value is there in circumcision? Well, based on these teachers, we would expect him to say none. <laughs> but instead, he says much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. And those words include the promises of the land of Israel to the Jewish people. He goes on to say, what if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar. What is it that God will be faithful to regarding unbelieving Israel if not the land promises? In other words, despite Israel's unbelief, God will be faithful to his covenant. Now, we're not talking here about the covenant of eternal life, which can only be received through the blood covenant cut by Yeshua himself. Paul is referring to God's promises to Israel through Abraham, namely the land promises. In Romans chapter 9, 
When Paul makes his impassioned plea, willing to trade his own salvation for that of Israel's, he says, The Israelites, to whom belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Notice he doesn't say belonged as in past tense, but to whom belong present tense, the covenants. That would include God's covenant with Abraham regarding the land of Israel. In chapter 11, Paul asked twice in verse 1 and then again in verse 11, has God rejected Israel? Both times he says, by no means. The Hebrew Bible says, chas v'chalila, or God forbid. And by not rejecting Israel, that must mean that God has not canceled his promises. In verse 29, Paul emphatically declares that even in unbelief, God's gifts and callings to Israel are irrevocable. In Acts chapter 1, Yeshua's disciples ask him if he is now going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Yeshua doesn't respond by saying that those promises are, are voided in light of the New Testament. Instead, he says that the Father knows the exact time to fulfill his promises. Zechariah tells us very clearly that Yeshua is returning to Jerusalem at a time when the Jewish people are under attack. If the promise of the land of Israel is null and void, then to where is Yeshua going to return? And lastly, Revelation 1-7 says, Look, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. Obviously speaking of the Jewish people. But if there are no longer any Jews or any Israel, of whom is John speaking? To be clear, the greatest promise of all is eternal life through Yeshua the Messiah. But as great and wonderful as this promise is, it doesn't cancel out God's former promises to Abraham regarding the land of Israel. So we see that not only does the New Testament affirm God's promises to Israel, it predicts a massive Jewish revival in the end times. Praise God. God did not replace the Jews with Christians as his chosen people. This lie is called replacement theology. Replacement theology is the teaching that the Christian church has replaced national Israel regarding the plan, purpose, and promises of God. Genesis 13, 14 through 17. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Romans 11.29 For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Why this great deception within the church? It's a supernatural phenomenon. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet Earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. Replacement theology is an abomination. It is unbiblical and it has resulted in virulent anti-Semitism that has in turn resulted in the deaths of millions of Jews. If you are a Christian and replacement theology is true and God is done with the Jew, what makes you think he isn't through with me and you? When God makes a promise, he cannot lie. So we know the promises he made to the Jews and to the Christian church will be fulfilled. Titus 1, 1 and 2. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Hebrews 6, 17 through 18. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. There is no reason for the church to be covetous of the promises that God has made to the Jewish people. He has also made some glorious promises to the church, one of which is the rapture. 
Additionally, we have been promised that we will reign with him over all the nations of the world during his millennial kingdom. And we have been promised that we will live with him eternally on a new earth, in a new Jerusalem, in new glorified bodies. It is no wonder that Paul wrote, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has the mind of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. The coming seven year tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation, in which the Jewish people will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him, as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. They will receive Yeshua as their Messiah. They will cry out, Baruch, Abba, Bashem, Edne. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What a glorious day that will be. What glory it will bring to the name of God. Zechariah 13, 8 and 9 And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, This is my people. And each one will say, The Lord is my God. Iran denied a request by French President Emmanuel Macron to include Saudi Arabia in negotiations for a new nuclear agreement. It's one of the latest developments in the effort to keep Iran from getting a nuclear bomb. President Macron warns that time is growing short to keep Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Iran says it's reaching its goal of producing 20% enriched uranium faster than expected. 20% is one step away from weapons-grade uranium. We were supposed to produce 120 kilograms of 20% uranium annually, but now in less than one month, we haven't reached about 17 kilograms, which is even ahead of our timetable. While the Biden administration says it wants to negotiate a stronger, better nuclear deal, Iran and its ally Turkey refuse that offer. Iran wants to use its leverage to drop the economic sanctions. I should emphasize this. America was the one who withdrew from the JCPOA and breached its commitments. Now it's America that should return to the JCPOA and fulfill its commitments. It also set a February 21st deadline for the EU signatories to drop sanctions or it will cut off access for U.N. nuclear inspectors and increase uranium enrichment. The Biden administration is considering naming Robert Malley as its envoy to the nuclear negotiations. Critics like Senator Tom Cotton said the choice of Malley would send the wrong signal to Iran. He tweeted, it's deeply troubling that President Biden would consider appointing Rob Malley to direct Iran policy. Malley has a long track record of sympathy for the Iranian regime and enemies towards Israel. The Ayatollahs wouldn't believe their luck if he is selected. In the meantime, Israel is watching closely. And on Sunday, Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz told an Egyptian TV station it's keeping open its military option to stop Iran's nuclear program. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Zechariah goes on to tell us in verse 6, that God will use the Israeli defense forces to destroy the Muslim nations that seek their destruction. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, 
and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17.9 In that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17.1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. A long forgotten prophecy that has recently been rediscovered by Bill Salas may enlighten us about the fate of Iran's current nuclear aspirations as we read in Jeremiah 49, 34-39. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will suffer the fate of a broken bow, which might imply that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps will be unable to launch scores of its missiles at its enemies. Additionally, he declares that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is the Bushehr nuclear reactor, located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah continues in verses 36 and 37. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them, until I have consumed them. Jeremiah informs that the attack upon the ancient territory of Elam will produce numerous refugees, perhaps even turning into a humanitarian crisis. Exiles will be dispersed worldwide as if being blown about by overpowering winds. In addition to the Lord, Iran has enemies in this prophecy. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Additionally, Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. Jeremiah's last two verses present the exiles of Jeremiah 49.36 with great news. I will set my throne in Elam, and will destroy from there the king and the princes, says the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. Iranians who accept Christ in advance of his second coming will be returned from global exile into the restored fortunes of their historic homeland in Elam. Moreover, Jerusalem and Elam are the only two earthly locations identified in Scripture for the future establishment of the Lord's throne. As we get closer to the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will reveal to students of Bible prophecy the relevance of additional overlooked prophecies concerning the end times. Is the prophecy of Elam one of those prophecies? There is a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Bethgarma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, Many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, 
and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, whose fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East, biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. For the first time, Israeli archaeologists have recovered 3,000-year-old pieces of fabric from the time of King David and King Solomon. The groundbreaking discovery sheds new light on the Bible, from the book of Genesis to the Gospels. The discovery took place on this hill in southern Israel. Archaeologists found the royal color purple fragments in the Timna Valley, and through carbon dating, confirmed the fabric had been preserved for 3,000 years. The real excitement was when Nama Dr. Nawaz Sukenek called me one day. She told me, well, we found this proof, the molecules of the color from the lab. It's true purple. True purple comes from an ancient sophisticated process using dye extracted from sea snails found in the Mediterranean Sea. It usually took a lot of work and thousands of snails, which made the dye sometimes worth more than gold. The dry desert conditions in the valley preserve the fabric. So we found in Timna the argaman, the more purplish color, which is associated with kings. Also the priests and also the tabernacle. It provides an excellent background to the biblical 
a record for this particular time. The region is mentioned a number of times in the Bible. The Timna Valley is located in the Negev Desert in southern Israel, and it's also the area of the kingdom of Edom. In the book of Genesis, chapter 36, we hear about the kings of Edom that uh, ruled over the land of Edom before Israel had kings. This land is also where Gideon defeated the Midianites. We hear in the, in the book of uh, Judges about the kings of Midian. When Gideon, uh, you know, kills, he, he, he killed all the Midianite kings, the spoil is actually the purple, the Algamant garments. So we really have an, a, a, a physical evidence. You can, you know, touch the, the, the garment of a, an important figure, if not the king, of these people uh, 3,000 years ago. And where David defeated his foes. We read in the Bible that King David went to south of the Dead Sea, the Valley of Salt, in the book of Samuel. And then he conquered the Edomites and put garrisons all over the land. Royal purple is also mentioned in the New Testament. Lydia from Thyatira in the book of Acts was known as a seller of purple, and purple is mentioned in the Gospels. We hear that the Romans, they actually forced Jesus to wear a purple robe in preparation to the crucifixion. The Romans claimed for, that he wanted to become a, the king of the Jews. Ben Yosef believes this discovery revolutionizes our understanding of the Bible. I think that this is a game changer in the way archaeologists and biblical scholars understand the reality at that time period. Some archaeologists dismiss the Bible because there's no traditional architectural evidence for ancient kingdoms like a city or a palace. But he says they were nomadic kingdoms that left little evidence behind. If you change the way you think about kings and kingdoms in this early period, and you understand that nomadic tribes could have had a kingdom, then some, suddenly everything, I think, becomes much more uh, simpler to understand and to interpret. He sees the pieces of royal purple fabric as evidence of these ancient biblical kingdoms and their kings. This is one of the more extraordinary stories coming out of Israel confirming the biblical record. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs? on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. 
While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.